Welcome to Calvary Temple Church, here in the heart of downtown Winnipeg. Calvary Temple is people, people of all generations and all nations. Stay tuned for a message of hope and encouragement. Understanding unbelief. Understanding unbelief. There's a story in Max Licato's book, In the Grip of Grace. Let me read this story to you today. It's in a horrendous story, but it's a truce. The, the, uh, it's fictional, yet it's based on truth. You and I have seen this on television many, many times. The Christy Adams talk show, and it goes like this. When did you discover that your boyfriend had been intimate with your mother? The audience snickered. The teenage girl on the stage ducked her head at the burst of attention. The mother was a middle-aged woman in a too tight black dress, sitting with her arm entwined with this squinny, one-of-a-boy kind, sleeveless t-shirt guy. She waved to the crowd, he grinned, and the talk show host, Christy Adams, wasted no time. Do you, do you two actually sleep together? The mother, still holding the hand of the boy, grinned and smiled and said yes, and she went on to explain that she'd been very lonely since her divorce, and this fellow, this young fellow boyfriend of her daughter would come over and they would talk and then all of a sudden they got too close and it happened. Aren't you worried, Christy says, about what this might teach to your daughter? Aren't you being a bad example? I'm only teaching her the ways of the world. The boy looked amazed. I still love her. I'm only helping her by helping her mother. We are one happy family. There's nothing wrong with that. And just as the hubbub began to erupt and people were hooting and hollering and yelling, and Christy said, not everyone would agree with you two. In fact, I've invited a guest to react to what you call your new lifestyle. And the crowd got quiet and anxious, wondering who would this be? And as Max Licato tells a story, he says he's the world's most famous theologian. His writings have long been followed by some and debated by others. Making his first appearance on the Christy Adams show is the Apostle Paul. And out walks a short, balding man with glasses and a tweed jacket. And Christy skipped the welcome and she went to, uh, you have trouble with what these people are saying, Apostle Paul? Paul held his hands in his lap, looked over at the trio, and then back at Christy. It's not all I feel that matters. It's how God feels. And Christy paused so the TV audience would hear the ooze ripple through the studio. Then tell us, please, Apostle Paul, how does God feel about this creative tryst? Well, it angers him. And why? Well, evil angers God, says the Apostle Paul. Evil destroys his children. What these people are doing is destroying them, and it's bad, it's evil. The strong words triggered a few hoots in the audience and some scattered applause and an outburst of raised hands, and Paul continued. As a result, God has left them and let them go their sinful way, their thinking is dark, their acts are evil, and God is disgusted. A lanky fellow in the front shouted out his objection. It's her body, she can do what she wants. Oh, Paul says, but that's where you're mistaken. Her body belongs to God, it's to be used for him. And another one yelled out, what they're doing is harmless. And the apostle Paul said to the mother, look at your daughter. Her eyes were full of tears. Don't you see that you have harmed her? You traded healthy love for lust. You traded the love of God for the love of flesh. You traded truth for a lie. And you traded the natural for the unnatural. The host could restrain herself no longer. 
Paul, do, do you know how weird you sound? You sound weird. All this talk about God and right and wrong and immorality, don't you feel out of touch with reality? He said, no, not out of touch. Out of place in this room, but not out of touch. God does not sit silently while his children indulge in perversion. He lets us go our sinful way, and we will reap the consequences. Every broken heart, every unwanted child, every war, every tragedy can be traced back to our rebellion against God and what he intended for us. The mother pointed her finger at the Apostle Paul's face, and Christie turned to the camera, delighting in the pandemonium. We've got to take a break now, but we'll be back with more questions. Don't go away. We'll be right back. Now, I want to ask you this morning, how does that dialogue strike you? Harsh? The Apostle Paul, a bit too narrow? The scene, bizarre, but we know that it happens on TV every week, every day. Outlandish. Yes, the script is fictional, but it is based on what we've all seen and heard if you flip on your television. But Paul's words are not fictional. They are taken right from Romans chapter 1. And in Paul's day, like our day, there was a lot of moral confusion. There was a lot of stuff going on that just was not right. Unbelief was rising. Doing what's right in my own eyes. No one can tell me what to do. There was a lot of that talk going on. So over the next few weeks, we're going to, over the summer, we're looking at the book of Romans. And we're going to talk about today things that Paul believes people need to know. What should we believe about sin? Does it exist? And here we are in a world of human independence. I can think anything I want. No one can tell me what to do. Human domination, human desire. And the book of Romans is Paul's effort to remind Christians what they believe, and we're going to have a good look at it over these next few weeks. So Paul does something that every good physician should do. He diagnoses the human predicament. Now, let's begin understanding the problem. And I think we all know that there's something fundamentally wrong with our world. It could be so good. It could be so right. What God made was so beautiful, even human relationships and marriage and intimacy, all of that could be so good, and yet our world has taken it and turned it into something that's so wrong. Certainly the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven. The wrath of God, Romans 1. Let's stop for a moment. And I can hear people in their minds whirling. What, what is it about you Christians? Why is your God always cranky? And why you always return to this wrath of God stuff? Isn't God a gracious God and a kind and merciful God? And doesn't he love each one of us? Even if there was only one of us, he would have died for us. Don't you believe that, Pastor? Yes, I believe that. But there's also something here about the fact that if there's no wrath of God, there's no love of God. You think about your love for your children. You think about the fact that your heart breaks when they violate the principles that you've set up. So let me quote for a moment from J.I. Packer. 
in his classic book, Knowing God, to an age that unashamedly sold itself to the gods of greed and pride and sex and self-will, the church says virtually nothing about God's judgment. The fact that subject of divine wrath has become taboo in modern society, and Christians by and large have accepted the taboo and conditioned themselves never to raise the subject so we don't talk about the fact that there's such a thing as the wrath of God. Admittedly, it's not popular, popular in any generation, but it's amazing how frequent it's dealt with by the prophets and the apostles and the Lord Jesus himself. Talks about judgment. So, if the Bible is vocal about the fact that there is such a thing as the justice and anger of God, then we need to look at it today. Listen to the Apostle Paul. The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. I want you to notice that word suppress. Suppress? They don't want to know the truth. They know what it is, but they don't want to know it. By their wickedness, since what may be known about God is plain to them, because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power, and divine nature have been clearly seen by under, being understood from what has been made so that people are without excuse. God loves us so much. His love is so powerful that he does not want us to destroy ourselves. He does not want us to come under judgment. This God that is so amazing. Max Lucado says, every star is an announcement. Each leaf is a reminder. The glaciers are megaphones. The seasons are chapters. The clouds are banners. Nature is a song of many parts, but one theme and one verse, and it is God is. Hallelujah. God is. I was thrilled recently to have a guest in the Buntane Chapel who spoke on creation and how marvelous it is to have a God who's powerful enough to create this world. And his view of Genesis was, was, was amazing and the things he taught. And a young adult in this church came up to me and said, Pastor, it was biblical creationism that brought me back to Jesus. I had rejected my faith of my childhood. I thought I knew more. And I got on their website, and I was seeking out the fact that, could my God be this big? And because of that, I have come back to Jesus, and I love him, and I serve him, and I'm forgiven, hallelujah. And that's what Paul's saying. He's saying that the heavens declare the glory of God. There's a great story about Helen Keller, the deaf, mute, and blind woman, and Ann Sullivan spent hours with her trying to teach her to talk, and, and Helen Keller said about God, I already know about him, I just didn't know his name. I knew, but I, but I, I didn't have a name. And she learned about Jesus. I want us to talk about the result of this rebellion. Clearly, there are consequences in our world today. We see them everywhere. On this living in denial, there is no God. There is no right or wrong. There is no justice. There is just whatever you want to do. Georgina Cleage put it this way, the thing about denial is that it doesn't feel like denial when it's going on. And yet, people are denying that there is order 
and decency and right and wrong. Let's pick up the Apostle Paul again. For although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him, but their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like a mortal human being and birds and animals and reptiles. And let me tell you, when we talk about idolatry, we're not just talking about statues that people bow down to. In fact, old John Calvin put it this way, he said, the human nature, so to speak, is a perpetual factory for idols. We betray ourselves, and you know that in our culture we are sports crazy. Stanley Cup playoffs and all that stuff and materialism, and movies, and all of that. Now, not all of that may be evil, but when it becomes more important than God, it can become the very idol of people who claim to love God. So this passage says there's no excuse. How many know human beings are masters at making excuses? I heard about this kid, went to school. He said to the teacher, my dog ate my homework. She said, your dog ate your homework? What kind of a dog is that? He said, well, I had to shove it down his throat, but he did eat it. And we, we, always, we always make excuses. So I want to give us four points of what happens when we get into suppressing truth and into denial. The deepening darkness of unbelief. And there's four points here that I want you to take home today. Human stubbornness. We refuse to submit to God as he revealed himself to us. Notice, we suppress the truth by our wickedness, verse 18. Although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God, they refused to do that. They did not think it worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God. So, number one, on the slippery slope downward, stubbornness, human stubbornness. Then vanity, what I will call intellectual independence. Their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. They became fools. They had a depraved mind, verse 28. I don't know if you've ever tried to reason with somebody that you can tell in the first 30 seconds you're going nowhere. Black is white, white is black. Have you ever had a meeting with someone? Have you ever worked with someone? And you had a meeting and you decided what we were going to do. We've had a plan, we talked, da 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 da. Three days later, you go see the person and they did da 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 da. And they didn't think, they didn't do one thing you had agreed on. That's what this is about. This is about people. They're not lacking for information. They do not fit into God's plan. They are independent in their thinking. Have you ever heard of the fellow Jastro, Robert Jastro? He's an amazing, amazing guy. One of the leading NASA scientists, and here's his quote. For the scientist who has lived by his faith in the power of reason, the story ends like a bad dream. He has scaled the mountain of ignorance. He is about to conquer the highest peak. He pulls himself over the final rock. He is greeted by a band of theologians who have been sitting there for centuries. <laughs> yeah. Third step. Well, just before I leave that point. You see, that's why a soldier in London, England got hacked to death in broad daylight. 
That's why 26-year-olds get shot. That's why we, we have this attitude, don't you make any claim over my right to do anything I want. And God says it will be a downward slope and it will be very dark. Judgment, God leaves us to our devices, therefore God gave them over. Verse 24, because of this, God gave them over. Verse 28, God gave them over. I don't know if you've ever heard a parent do this. I hope I haven't done it, but maybe I have. A child, can I, can I? 30 seconds later, can I? Why can't I? Can I? Why can't I? Why can't I? And finally the parent in desperation goes, okay then, do it. How many know that that's likely bad news? I hope the kid wasn't asking to play in the traffic. I hope the kid wasn't asking to do brain surgery. I hope the kid wasn't asking to do something that's going to destroy them. But that's exactly what happens when people suppress truth and will not submit to truth. There comes a point when God says, go, do it. Have your own way. But remember, it's not going to be pretty. And then fourthly and finally in our slide through Romans 1. Recklessness, we prove our rebellion. If you would have told me in 1964 when I was a student at the Walkerton Public School where the Anglican minister's wife and Dr. Allen's wife and this one over here, that we're on the school board. We were all in the community together. Every one of the kids I knew got spanked when they were bad. We just lived in a normal little world. If you would have told me that we now live in a world where people are saying, what's wrong with teachers loving their students? What's wrong with intimacy of all different kinds and descriptions? What's wrong with that? Well, it gets pretty sick, is what happens. Filled with every kind of wickedness, verse 29. And we like to pick out the, the gender confusion verses here, and they are in here, but they belong in a list. Now, I haven't printed the list, but listen, they are full of envy and murder and strife and deceit and malice and gossip and slandering and God-haters and insolent and arrogant and boastful. They, in, they invent new ways of doing evil. And do you know what else is in the list? They disobey their parents. And now we live with a third and fourth generation where the parents had no moral upbringing, and now there is very little hope. So I conclude with this question, is there a remedy? Well, this is the book of Romans, chapter 1. I am not ashamed of the gospel. Good news! <laughs> you say, this is a pretty depressing sermon, Pastor. Good news! You know that Paul wrote to a church and said, some of you were just like that, but now you have good news. I'm so glad I don't have to be tied to my past. I'm so glad that I can have a fresh start. I'm so glad that the blood of Jesus can cleanse me from all sin. It is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes. It's good news, and we have to believe it. First to the Jew, then to the Gentile. For in the gospel of the righteousness of God is revealed. A righteousness is that is by faith from first to last. You know, there are some people who think you get saved by faith and kept by works. 
But our salvation is from first to last by faith. And we need to exercise faith every day to walk in the right way, to repent of our sin, to follow Jesus. Yes, this gospel is good news. And I conclude with what is the gospel? The first five verses of chapter 1, Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle, this is the only cure for our world. You will not legislate morality. It won't happen. In fact, people will look at you and say, are you nuts? You're not going to make people stop doing that. No, you won't, unless God changes their hearts. Paul, servant of Christ, called, set apart, gospel of God, the gospel he promised through the prophets and the Holy Scriptures regarding his Son, who through the Spirit of holiness was appointed the Son of God in power by his resurrection from the dead. Jesus Christ our Lord, through him we receive grace and apostleship to call on the Gentiles to the obedience that comes from faith for his name's sake. Let's look at it real quickly. This gospel comes from God. It's not a human document. It's a God-sent message. God so loved the world. Its substance is all about Christ. Its confirmation is that it's proclaimed in the Old Testament. It is foreshadowed in the Old Testament. It is rooted in history. It is rooted in God's heart. Its scope is the nations. The word Gentiles means people who are non-Jewish. It's for everybody. It's immediate purpose to bring people to faith. To have faith. Through him we receive grace and apostleship to call the Gentiles to obedience that comes from faith. And the ultimate goal, you might want to add this to your notes, the glory of Christ's name. And I encourage all of us Yes, let's be honest about the world we live in. But let's recognize that the only solution is the gospel. This will not be socially reformed. It will not happen through education alone. There must be a change of heart, and Jesus is the heart changer. And everybody said, Amen. Thank you for watching the broadcast. An audio recording of today's message is available simply for the asking. Write, email, or call our toll-free number and request it by the CD offer shown on the screen. Our program is viewer-supported. It is people like you who help pay for the airtime. Thank you for your continued giving. We look forward to hearing from you. Please join us again next week for another episode of Calvary Temple Church. God bless you.